Hello again, everybody. Uh, hope everyone had a good lunch. Next up will be Dane Williams of Aviation Safety Asia and Bori Fagan of Falconer Aircraft Management, presenting on ISBAO and ISBA, respectively. Dane is joining us from Hong Kong, and Bori is joining from the Philippines. Gentlemen, feel free to start when you're ready. Thank you, Jeff. Good afternoon to you all in our virtual ASBA community from uh, here in Hong Kong. Welcome to the final session of this inaugural virtual safety summit. My name is Dane Williams. I'm the Director of Aviation Safety Asia, a leading supplier of ISBAO and ISBA accreditation services in the region. Today I'll be predominantly discussing the ISBAO standard. And uh, joining me is Mr. Rory Fagan from Manila, as mentioned, who will primarily discuss the ISBA standard. Today's discussion will be relaxed. It will involve a lot of Q&A and we'll look to assist operators with some of the uh, nuances of the program, some hot tips and ways that they can benefit from the ISBAO ISBAR program and simplify their initial and renewal accreditation audits. Over to you for a second, Rory. Good afternoon, everybody. Greetings from Manila. Um, pleasure to be here. As I said, my name is Rory Fagan. From Falcon Aircraft Management. I'm an ISBA accredited auditor, and we're also a uh, ISBAO Stage 2 um, entity from the Philippines. So, looking forward to the discussions uh, and we'll keep it relaxed, free flowing, and uh, that's it. Great. Thanks, Rory. No worries. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, yeah, today we'll give you a, a quick uh, program overview. We're not here to take anything from uh, IBAC. Uh, they're the experts in regards to discussing their program and all uh, reference material can be found at uh, www.ibac.org. However, we'll just give a, a quick refresh on that. We'll talk about the benefits uh, for ASBAR members of becoming accredited under the ISBAO or the ISBAR programs. We'll look at some hot tips as discussed. Uh, we'll talk uh, in detail about the remote audit uh, processes which are available to operators at the moment. And it's um, creating uh, some flexibility and some cost saving options and has been quite uh, well adopted in the region. And then uh, as mentioned, we'll have a question and answer session for Rory and myself. So is Bayo, uh, the program, it is uh, operationally focused versus is bar, which Rory will touch on is uh, more ramp and uh, handling agent focused. It's based on the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, SARPs, the Standards and Recommended Practices. Annex 6, Part 2, Subpart K, all those uh, good references that you may hear thrown around. Uh, what bases uh, a number of these uh, accreditation standards? And we're not looking for uh, compliance, it's conformance with those standards. We'll talk about that more further in the presentation. Uh, it's also the... Uh, Okay, uh, SMS Annex, which we can show conformance to if we are to become accredited to ISBAR across the number of different stages, which we'll touch on. Sorry, ISBAO or ISBAR. Uh, the domestic and international scope uh, allows us to then have a level of uh, safety which is accepted and adopted by any ICAO contracting state. And we can touch on how that can benefit operators into Europe, for example, uh, part NCC operations or TCO approvals for a third party operation, a third country operation, sorry. And the uh, ISBAO program especially is scalable. Uh, it can move from uh, flight plan stage one, which is a, a new initiative from IBAC, where uh, operators can use a approved supplier to help them implement uh, ISBAO and then go to their first uh, stage one audit and then continue to move through the stages from stage two in a traditional method. And it also has uh, the scalability to have a phased uh, phase stage three accreditation option now, where you don't actually have to have full conformance with each of the stage three standards, but still can be awarded uh, a stage three accreditation. It just may have just a two year validity versus three, which um, is one of the options with stage three accreditation. Uh, it's also scalable in the sense that uh, operators with one aircraft versus operators with 52 aircraft can be a part of the program and that all of the systems and the uh, deliverables uh, that show conformance within the program are commensurate with the size of the operation. Implementation support is available and we'll talk about that further. 
Um, there are approved organisations to conduct implementation support. And as Rory will emphasise, uh, unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, uh, to keep the integrity in the program, obviously, uh, somebody who assists with implementation of your ISBAO or your ISBAR uh, setup can't be the person or the organisation that does your audit. Moving on to ISBAR, Rory. Yeah, I would like to follow on from that. As, as Dane has pointed out, it's, it's where it's the kind of sister program under IBAC, primarily focusing on FBOs, ground handling organisations, ramp and trip support companies. Again, the, the key principle for both programs is the SMS, which uh, in most ground handling entities is, is not a requirement globally. So it's uh, again, based on the ICAO SMS principles, the four pillars as we're all familiar with. Um, there's varying scope for approvals. You don't have to be a full blown FBO to become uh, ISBA accredited. Uh, as you complete or you go through towards your audit stage, you you fill in your protocols and you the uh, protocols are configured to uh, suit your organization. You can be a trip support company to get and get accredited as well as opposed to a full blown FBO. You just have to have oversight of anything you outsource, which again is a key SMS principle. And again, the program is scalable for, for multiple um, FBOs, uh, multiple entities, uh, again, globally around. It is a conformance-based approach. It's not compliance. So it's an elective standard uh, on, on the same principles as uh, is, is BAO. Um, you can decide to do it. You can decide not to do it. We'll talk about the advantages of, of doing it, why we think it's worthwhile going forward. And again, there is implementation support available. We will Anybody who's in an ISBAO operator out there and anybody looking at ISBAO, we would you know, recommend that you follow the same process for both in that you do a good, strong and robust gap analysis um, prior to your audit and you work out the best way where your gaps are before you have the full audit. And the same as that, again, anybody who comes in um, for, to assist you in your implementation can come in and then essentially audit their own work thereafter. So it's based on the same principles then as ISBAO. Um, that's practically it. Yeah, as I said, the main focus in overriding is the work in ground handling for years when there was no SMS is that it, it does require you to have SMS and emergency response and, and a very strong oversight on your maintenance of your GSE. Um, yeah. All right. So, yeah, uh, thanks, Rory. To, um, to further emphasize the program, um, you may have heard Rory and I both talk about conformance, not compliance. Uh, it's essential that we uh, emphasize here that ISBAO and ISBA are, are not mandatory. Operators choose to become ISBAO or ISBA accredited. They choose that because they see op, uh, benefits and such, and we'll talk about some of those benefits soon. But it's entirely voluntary, the standard, and conforming with the standard is up to you, and the way that you conform to the standard is also up to you. This is what we talked about in regards to the size and scope being commensurate with the size of your operation. A uh, single aircraft operator may choose to run their SMS uh, in a paper-based version or in Excel files, whereas a large organization may have their own dedicated software for running the uh, SMS, the inputs, the outputs, the reporting via apps, et cetera, that, that they've either purchased off the shelf or in some cases with large operators, we see them developing their own uh, coding to have their own dedicated in-house software for such. So. It is scalable and it is conformance, not compliance. An acceptable means of compliance for Rory's organization may not be an acceptable means of compliance for my organization or a rotary wing operator versus a international class A aircraft operator that's, that's flying across the North Atlantic all the time. There are differences there, but just remember it is optional. Um, to, to emphasize the stages, uh, most people who are familiar with it will understand this, but th to simplify that, stage one is infrastructure. So you can actually get accredited to ISBAO, or I'm not sure about ISBAO, Rory can comment there, but ISBAO without having an aircraft, without having the operation up and running, because it's the infrastructure, you need to have the bones of the uh, organization there. That usually involves as a minimum manuals, staff, training, and then the ability for people to uh, act on the inputs and act on what you promise in your manual when the aircraft and operation commences. So think of stage one as, as the bones or the skeleton. Stage two is when you're getting some inputs and you're managing the risk associated with the uh, operation. 
and that's when the skeleton starts to grow. There's a little bit of meat on the bones, I guess. And stage three is when we see maturity in the safety and culture of the organisation, that everything's integrated, that the inputs that are coming in through the SMS and the likes are then coming back in a full closed loop system. And we're seeing that the risks are being mitigated and that SPIs and SBTs, which are safety performance indicators and targets, are working towards improving your organization's safety health. Anything to add there, Rory? No, just to, to, to uh, kind of emphasize what you said there on the, the different stages. From an auditor's perspective, they look at it as stage one, as in you talk the talk. So you, you describe in your ops manuals um, and your safety manuals what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Uh, you do put your, your infrastructure in place and you're essentially ready to go. Then your stage two is that you walk the walk. They want to be able to see the order that what you have in your book is, is what's happening. Uh, that expectation is not there for stage one, which is, it makes it that little bit easier. The stage two, so they come in and they, will, they want to see it, it working, so demonstrate. And if you're quite creative with questions as how to, how to understand that, I'll be a little bit difficult with the, uh, with the online now, but... That's typically when the auditor wants to see that you're doing what you say you're doing, which is a key component of the auditing process. And then again, yeah, the, your SBIs and SBTs are a key component of the stage three. They want to see your safety culture is working. Um, they want to be able to demonstrate through interviews that your, you know, your council manager down and from your, 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 your hangar floor up understands what the SMS is, how it works, what their role in the SMS is. Um, the meetings, meetings uh, minutes meetings are very powerful statements. Want to be able to see they can look at it an experienced auditor able to see when you're dissecting an, an event or or a uh, or a hazard analysis that it's actually meaningful and it's happened and the, the key people is essentially the key people involved in that process have been involved in those uh, in those assessments so yeah great okay thank you <clears throat> so let's look at some key program differences just to emphasize here as rory touched on in particular SMS is the cornerstone of both programs. So be aware that when you uh, look to become accredited or you pursue is there, SMS is going to be a large part of your accreditation audit. And that is chapter three, combined with chapter four, the ERP, uh, when we look at the accreditation standards and the protocols which uh, they use. <clears throat> uh, those protocols have some common elements across both ISBAO and ISBAR. There's actually nine of them that are common. And whilst the documentation requirements for ISBAR will be different to ISBAO, they still have the same chapters and same protocols. Similarly for security, uh, we would look at some airborne related security for ISBAO versus more ground and airport related security for ISBAR, training differences, et cetera. So they are same, uh, named the same, the elements or the protocols or the chapters within those. However, there are some slight variances, but it does show that if you have implemented ISBAO, well, you're probably 50% of the way to implementing ISBAR if you were to use a common SMS and vice versa. Uh, in ISBAO only, there's the additional five sections there, which you can see, which are flight operations maintenance, the aircraft equipment and the fit out of that aircraft. There is an aircraft inspection element of an audit. And there's a requirement that auditors inspect as a minimum 10% of your fleet during an initial or renewal audit. Uh, there's also some fatigue considerations. And then at the end there, the optional OTAR accreditation, which is an add-on, if you like, to the ISBAO accreditation. And that shows that a special regulatory requirement has been met for uh, the OTAR states and their additional items have been assessed in the audit. Uh, this is usually the Cayman uh, or Bermuda uh, style regulatory bodies. And there is some uh, push for other regulatory bodies within our region to be adopting or considering adopting mm -hmm. a similar approach. Uh, for Isba, I'll let you talk there, Rory. Yeah, as I said, there's the, the common elements are there. Again, SMS centric for obvious reasons is by then splits off and goes down an additional focus of your airside ops, your passengers and bags, your GSE and GSE maintenance. Uh, one of the key things about the ISBAR program is they're very keen on preventative maintenance, which is uh, again, a good SMS practice as opposed to, you know, fix on fail. They want you to be able to look at 
to your standards? Have you a preventative maintenance program? Can you demonstrate it? Uh, the environmental side of it would be obviously different insofar as focusing on, you know, the examples like fuel spills, how do you manage fuel spills on the ramp, et cetera, and the security is more air side, land side. So there, there are obvious parallels as to the different uh, differences between a flight operation and for a ground handling operation, but essentially they cover the same things and they look at the areas of your business, they split them down in a, in a logical basis um, and they then look at, you know, very robust um, protocols that you must follow. Um, and again, from a conformance standard and not compliance. Yes, okay. And uh, the training requirements, they vary slightly as well. Uh, ISBAR has a requirement to do a refresher training for the fundamentals uh, element for organisations. That's one representative attending every 36 months. At the moment, uh, ISBAO have an initial only requirement for that. Um, I will note that the, uh, the training uh, element has gone online in the last 12 months for the fundamentals and the auditor accreditation training and uh, with good success. So um, there may be some changes around that in the future. We're not sure, but it's uh, that's certainly been adopted and, and I believe continue to be adopted in the post-COVID world. All right, so onto the more interesting parts. We've had the overview. Let's talk about this. Why would I pay for this is Bayo is bar audit thingy? Um, a question we get asked a lot. Um, and as we said, it is entirely voluntary. But the key to it is, and I know it seems like a boring sort of first dot point there, this shows your conformance to ICAO and what they are after and all of the contracting states. So when you travel around the world, you can say, I've been assessed against what you agree to be the required safety standards. And, uh, and that can work very well for you, uh, is Bayo. Uh, in his bio terms, if you were to be ramp checked and uh, to produce a certificate that shows you are, have a valid his bio accreditation, and uh, it is it has been evidenced and it is commonly uh, said that a, that a ramp inspection from EASA or similar would would go a lot easier and be very light on. Um, the second point there we touched on briefly. This standard is recognised for his bio. Uh, as an acceptable means of compliance, and it does look to reduce regulatory oversight. Um, CASA in 2014 in Australia conducted an aviation safety review, and recommendation 27 from that report was that they actually use these third party accreditations more when looking at the risk based approach to going out and doing uh, regulatory visits of operators. So, whichever is your local regulatory body within the region, um, there is evidence there from CASA in writing from an aviation safety review that says if um, if we conform to these additional standards, probably the regulatory uh, standard being here, we're uh, adhering to a standard a little bit higher uh, voluntarily that um, it would be great if uh, your, you could see that your risk is reduced and uh, there would be less inspection audits. Uh, I talked about the NCC requirements for EASA and the TCO requirements. I won't go into that with too much detail. Happy to follow that up with a question if anyone has afterwards, but uh, that's the uh, third country operator to show that you're meeting the requirements, the higher requirements of safety uh, management in Europe S or European airspace and Europe operations. Um, I'll let you talk more about the SMS elements there. Um, and even you can maybe give us an example if you don't mind about insurance, Rory. That'd be good. Yeah, I mean, apart from being an ISBA auditor, we are an ISBAO entity, a stage two, as I said. We've got a very attractive uh, bursary from our insurance company when we hit our stage one. Um, and it basically pays for my SMS software and it pays for my uh, contract with, with Kenyan International to cover our emergency response planning um, side of it. So it is actually very worthwhile. And it is something to ensure, you know, if you do, if and when you do get any approved SMS, uh, that you make sure that you contact your insurance company. They will even help you achieve it and fund it as well. Um, and another advantage I just want to touch on from a, to go down the ISBA route is as an ISBAO operator, as we plan our trips and as we look, you know, globally where we're going to go and, and, and who handles us, we will be, you know, we are encouraged by IBAC and we encourage, you know, internally to look for an ISBA accredited FBO. Or handler because we're you know it gives us some sort of security that they have an SMS and they are an organisation that has it that has it a standard and that they um, they're reputable. So we actually go and seek out is by accredited entities to handle us uh, if and when we fly. Okay, 
Very good. All right. Uh, mm. Moving on to some hot tips for operators. So we want you to get some benefit out of this presentation. And uh, Roy and I have been around the traps for a while, so we, we certainly uh, know what the good and the bad things. And, and uh, we, we're all about trying to make this uh, more efficient and uh, as simple as possible. So um, we can touch on this more in the Q&A section as well, but some high level hot tips from, from both Rory and I and from our experience and from the auditors within the group um, have seen huge benefits in, um, in the following. So, so firstly, when you go to pursue his bay or his bar, you can get a significant discount by purchasing such through your local uh, aviation association, whether that is ABAA down to the south of Asia in Australia, or whether that is MEBA in the Middle East, or if that is ASBAR, obviously, I think it's um, quite significant, uh, 500 US dollars uh, less for your registration and your uh, manuals. And when I say manuals there, that is purchasing your standards so that you have the manual to know what the IBAC is by always bar standard is that you're trying to achieve. With that, you get access to a number of resources and a login um, by www.ibac.org. Uh, the second point would be to use endorsed products that already exhibit conformance. Uh, remember we talked about there being many different ways to show conformance. Uh, this mm. will save you a lot of grief, headaches, and give you peace of mind if you're using a product that either IBAC have endorsed, which uh, aviation manuals, we show their, their logo. They are actually an approved supplier of manuals to uh, IBAC or to member associations, I guess. And, uh, and, and their manual is conformant with the latest version of the standard. So you know that from day one, you know that your skeleton is a good skeleton. It's, it's just needs to be built up and, and get some meat on those bones and then get ready to go to war or go to the Olympics and get super fit for stage three. Um, <clears throat> so that's a good, a very uh, uh, hot tip, I guess. Uh, there, there are some other products out there such as uh, online training provided by Flight Safety International that is IBAC endorsed and if you subscribe to the IBAC uh, package, I guess, or suite or, or whatever that is uh, in regards to online training, um, that package of courses will ensure that you for his bay, are, I'm not sure about his bar yet, have 100% uh, conformance there. Similarly, uh, there's the NATA programs in Safety One or Safety First, which would do that uh, in the ISBA world. So, so yeah, uh, those two top top tips at the top uh, can save you a lot of headache. You, you probably hit 50% of the way there if you were to do that. Uh, from there, use the IBAC implementation material and guides. That's all part of your subscriptions. That's at IBAC.org. And uh, there's some good guidance there. Consider program support affiliates. There's people that are just dedicated to help uh, implementation. And there's also now the uh, flight path stage one with uh, IBAC for ISBAO. Um, I'll let you talk about the second half there, Rory. Down to gap analysis we are. Yeah, I think you're, you're leaving me with the one that's, that's of most benefit, that the one that I'd most recommend to anybody who's done, been through this audit process will know. If you do a good gap analysis, you really are clearing away a lot of the dead wood and, and highlighting a lot of the issues before you do your audit. I cannot recommend it highly enough um, that you invest in a very good, robust gap analysis, a meaningful one, an honest one. Uh, you're not trying to hide stuff from the auditor here. There's no, you know, not going to be rebuked or picked up on, on your gap analysis. It, it saves you a huge amount of time and pain for both yourself and the auditor um, to do a good gap analysis again. Again, look for your uh, reputable. You have to be accredited to come in and do this, and you can check the auditor's accreditation. The experience is, is obviously part of it. You can't become accredited unless you have the experience. Um, the benefits of the SMS, I think everybody knows those. Um, cannot promote it highly enough but with an SMS working and integrated throughout your business. Um, it's the only way to manage safety efficiently and effectively. Um, then go for the higher stages. Again, you are, you know, the better your safety culture in the company, the more, the safer you become, the more efficient you become, and the better learning generative safety culture you have in your in your organization, the better. Um, so I would encourage anybody to keep going up to up to stage three. Uh, dedicated software. Um, I'm not plugging this, but I use an extra one called ASQS. Um, they they save me a huge amount of time. Um, if, like me, you're you're kind of a one-man band, and uh, you know resources at the minute, both you know human and, and capital, are, are very tight for obvious reasons. It saves me a huge amount of work. Uh, I can I can do my quality audits through it. We have our reporting uh, runs through it. We do our management to change modules through it. 
Um, and there's plenty of them out there. Um, and we're happy, myself and Dane, to give any advice anybody wants thereafter. But it can save you a huge amount of time as opposed to doing it by paper or as opposed to having you know different systems. Try and integrate it, try and put it together and, and certainly make it work for you. Plenty of providers out there. And again, you can you can go online in the, in the ISBA program and you can see all the accredited FBOs that are out there for your use. You can get a look at the accredited auditors in your region um, and worldwide as well. So um, they're the hot tips. As I said, my, my big takeaway for anybody here would be the gap analysis is probably the key. Yeah, thanks, Roy. Um, and also in regards to this uh, dedicated software, there's quite inexpensive subscriptions to the iPad applications, which... Uh, <clears throat> we can show you that actually have all of the chapters and protocols of the ISBAO and ISBAR standard uploaded so that you could, there's roughly 12 standards, uh, sorry, chapters within the standard of each each standard. And uh, you could just go and knock off one of those uh, chapters each month. And then all of a sudden, you know that you're 100% in conformance uh, with the uh, ISBAO or ISBAR requirements by the time your audit comes around. Okay, uh, moving forward. So remote auditing, uh, I'll talk on this one primarily because uh, I've got some good experience with it now. And the remote auditing uh, process came in as a result of COVID, as you can imagine. And you can see there a picture of uh, myself in the bottom of that uh, screen. This is an audit that uh, happened for a company, uh, Funian Aviation in Shenzhen. It was their stage two ISBAO renewal. And uh, it happens just like this, similar to a normal ISBAO or ISBAR entry meeting and the likes around the boardroom table, but it worked quite well virtually. Um, so to keep everyone in the loop, the uh, IBAC remote audit policy continues to be available. It's been extended until the 30th of June next year. And the uh, discussion I am hearing is that it may be extended further, depending obviously on the COVID situation and the likes, or it'll be partially adopted moving forward. And that may mean, for example, I, I don't know this, but Let's, uh, let's say that it's possibly uh, one year it's a remote audit or one renewal it's a remote audit and the next one is an on-site inspection or vice versa or an elements of, of either there. That's all to be determined by IBAC in the future. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, people using the downtime. Uh, savvy operators are taking stock during hiatuses, during periods of less operations. They're going and fixing up their manuals and their SMS and tidying up uh, some things that they hadn't been doing documented their change management and then said, you know what, we can bring our audit forward up to six months without penalty. So if our audit was due as far away as December next year, so December 2021, with this ability to use the six months of bringing it forward without penalty and the remote audit policy, they can then uh, see some cost savings with uh, less travel and they can get their ducks in order and do a remote audit in June of 2021, six months early, and then they still have their renewal date of December 2021, plus the two years after that, so 2.5 years. Um, so a lot of people are making the most of that at the moment. Uh, the full scope is now allowed, which is great. So initially it was just stage one and stage two, uh, but now they're allowing stage three because I back it comfortable with the integrity in the process and what's being checked. The audit itself is a little bit different. For example, the aircraft inspection will be carried out by something like WeChat or WhatsApp or uh, FaceTime video to, uh, to walk around the aircraft and look at the registration plates to look to see if the safety cards and the life jackets are in place to check that the uh, checklists, the electronic or paper checklists are the latest and up to date, to check that the flight manuals on board, to check that the aircraft is physically sound and, and in good condition, to check that the exits aren't blocked, et cetera, et cetera. So that can be achieved uh, quite well um, by a remote audit using technology. Good connectivity is essential. There are some challenges uh, if that, um, is a challenge in your area with regards to internet connectivity, especially when you're in the ramp, on the ramp, sorry, or in a hangar, and you're trying to do a stream of video for an auditor, that can cause trouble. Um, and then the other thing is to watch some of the um, applications and the ability to use software in different parts of the world. For example, different software is used in mainland China versus, um, I guess, more to the south of our Hong Kong at the moment, we find. And uh, the remote, the remote, 
fundamentals training is now uh, live. As I mentioned before, you can do your renewal training uh, without having to travel. Just the time zone is a little bit difficult because the course are normally run from uh, the US or London, but they have facilitated uh, one course so far in the Asia time zone, which was great. So that's the remote audit process. There may be some questions about that towards the end. Um, saying that, we'll move forward. So that's all uh, Rory and I have in regards to slides. Uh, we are, we do have some time left. So I think around 10 minutes, if um, if there's any questions there, I'll stop sharing the uh, screen and, and we can go from there. Please reach out to Rory or I on LinkedIn. Um, we can't share our business cards. We can't have a drink with you afterwards. We can't shake your hand or high five you or virtually high five you, elbow bump you, whatever at the moment. So um, yeah, please reach out on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, fire away with any questions uh, anyone has there. Okay, so I'm looking at the Q&A. You, can you see any coming through there, Rory? Uh, yeah, we'll hold for uh, just two minutes on for questions. Um, well, I have one here for both Dan and Rory. Um, you know, um, what, like, uh, you mentioned like the training has has gone online, right? Um, what what kind of um, additional adjustments have you seen um, in this last year? Um, might they stay online permanently afterwards, uh, just because that could be more efficient in some ways, or do you think um, uh, there will be some um, back to normal? Good question. Um... I've just recently completed the online fundamentals and uh, order to uh, renew a uh, training. Uh, I think people have been pushing for this for some time and uh, I think it is beneficial. However, um, speaking to, to Kurt actually at, at last year's uh, ASBA Safety Summit in the Philippines, uh, he is keen to keep the uh, interaction there where possible as well uh, for the face-to-face -face training. So I think, um, I think we'll see a stage process here and I think we'll still see elements of the um, of the uh, online training. It also depends how this pandemic um, unfolds, I guess, Jeff. Yeah, I, I'd like to echo that as well. I think there, there are benefits for it. I did my last one for his, for uh, in the classroom and then the pandemic is hit and amongst us, the auditors and the community as well, there is a, a kind of a desire for people to, to take some elements of it and, and do it online. Um, it is, you know, it's two days and it's quite intensive. Um, so that's what I'd, I'd maybe encourage that feedback from um, registered entities back to Kurt and I back and to the to the program themselves and push it. I certainly can see the benefits of it. I do enjoy being in a class as an auditor and as, as, a, as a safety guy but at the end of the day um, we're now coming out of the COVID situation. Cost is an absolute premium and I think there's, there has to be scope for this to be explored. Um, thanks for those uh, for the answers. Uh, a follow-up question is well we have one actually. If you guys can read that as well. Yeah, I see that. Uh, thanks for the question, Thomas. Uh, Rory, Dane, do you believe remote audits will be a desirable future standard to most members now that people have worked through the method to do things remote? Uh, yes, I think it's a desirable um, for the operators. Definitely, Thomas. It's uh, in a way, I don't, I don't want to say easier, but uh, I think um, the way that we've learned to use technology, uh, I can ask Rory, for example, if I was doing his audit now, to show me uh, pilot XYZ's medical certificate and that he has completed CRM training in the last two years. And Rory would just drag it from his screen next to me and drop it into WhatsApp, mm -hmm. Dropbox, WeChat, yep. whatever yep. it is. And it's, it's virtually real time. Um, the other thing that's happening, Thomas, and I probably should have touched on this for the remote auditing, is that operators are allowing auditors read-only access to their systems to ensure 100% integrity in the audit. I recently conducted an audit uh, with an organisation in Singapore and, uh, and we had access to their SMS and we could see what memos they'd sent out. We could see what, uh, what people had read and signed and acknowledged. We could see their risk assessments. And they had no problem in showing us that we had read access only, um, and, and and it works quite well. It's the same with our maintenance programs; you can get read access to uh, online training. You can go and sample it all, and it allows for uh, differences in time zone. It, it doesn't tie you up as much. There's no logistics with travel, so 
um, I think a, a, a large element is here to stay for this remote auditing. It, I also understand IBAC want to have integrity though, and uh, and they may require some on-site elements, and I can't answer that on their behalf. Yeah, the same. The, the one element in the ISBAR program would be the, the access to the ramp, that there's a requirement for the auditor to actually go on the ramp and put the hand in the wound, as they say, and, and that's something that the program, I won't speak on their behalf, I would assume would be keen keen to promote. But certainly, as an auditee recently, um, the remote stuff is fantastic. And, it, it, you know, um, it saves you going around with a bunch of paper, picking up files or, or certificates, it's all there. And from an auditor's perspective, you have it all on a Dropbox file. You can go and revisit it. And if you forget something, it's all there. So I, you know, let's face it, we're a long way away from opening up the world. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of the elements of, of the online stay. And I think a drive to kind of balance the need for somebody to go and actually see the facility and see the, the ramp to what we can do online safely and efficiently. Okay, well, we have five more minutes in our slot. If there's any further questions. Uh, Please feel free to ask Dane the rest of the questions. It'd be great. Thank you. <laughs> Rory's, Rory's dying to answer your questions. Um, so there's no more online training uh, in the region uh, in our time zone for this year. Um, the schedule will come out for that. Anyone who's interested uh, early next year from IVAC and uh, and last uh, training was run in the Australia time zone. So it was a little bit early um, for some participants. It was an ISBAO uh, course and uh, it was attended by a number of ASBAR members, predominantly actually from the Philippines so, and Hong Kong. Yeah. So uh, for us in Hong Kong and the Philippines, it was a 6 a.m. start versus a 9 a.m. start in Australia. But uh, we've given them that feedback and we can expect a course, I think, in the age of time zone uh, next year, hopefully for both ISBAO and ISBAR. All right, I see one comment in the chat. Maybe that's uh, not relevant to us. Right, we got that one, so. Yeah, I think we're good. All right, if there's nothing further, I'll hand back to you, uh, Jeffrey and Kathy and, and the guys at uh, ASBAR headquarters. And thank you very much, uh, everyone. And uh, please reach out on uh, LinkedIn or via uh, aviationsafety.asia. Uh, and Rory and I are, are available to help and um, stay safe out there, guys. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh,